Chapter 19, Secured Transactions and Bankruptcy, Part 2, presented by Kelly Herzig. In Part 2 of Chapter 19, we're going to discuss bankruptcy. We will discuss bankruptcy and reorganization, the Bankruptcy Act and its goals, bankruptcy proceedings, and the specific types of relief available. We will discuss Chapter 7, Liquidation, Chapter 11, Reorganization, Chapter 13, Individual Payment Plans, and Chapter 12, which is Family Farm and Family Fishery Plans. This part of the lesson will explain bankruptcy law and its goals, an overview of the Bankruptcy Code, and the specific types of relief available under the Code. We will begin with bankruptcy and reorganization generally. When an entity cannot pay its debts, bankruptcy law provides options to resolve its debts. Bankruptcy remedies are available to individuals, family farms and fisheries, partnerships and corporations. A debtor, one who owes money to other entities, may not qualify for every bankruptcy remedy depending on the debtor's status and the level of their debt. The types of bankruptcies are organized by chapter. There's Chapter 7, which is liquidation. It is the most common bankruptcy. Then there's Chapter 9, which is an adjustment of a municipality's debts. We will not cover that, but that is what Chapter 9 covers. There's Chapter 11, reorganization. This is usually for business debts. Big companies have often used this, like the airlines. Then there's Chapter 12, reorganization of family farm or fisheries debt. Chapter 13, Reorganization of an Individual's Debt. And then there's Chapter 15, Recognition of Foreign Bankruptcy and Relief for Foreign Debtors. We will not cover that chapter, but that is the scope of Chapter 15. Next, we will discuss the Bankruptcy Act and its goals. There are two general goals of bankruptcy laws. It provides protection to creditors to whom a debtor owes money by distributing assets fairly among categories of creditors, and it permits the debtors to gain a fresh financial start. Bankruptcy law provides an organized method for an insolvent debtor who cannot timely pay his or her debts to respond to their debts. Bankruptcy law is federal law established by Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution which expressly gave Congress the power to pass bankruptcy laws. If you may rec recall from our earlier lessons, bankruptcy law is exclusively federal. You can only file a bankruptcy action in federal court. And most courts have a bankruptcy court that is specially created. It is an Article I type court. Bankruptcy judges serve for 14 years. The bankruptcy code is contained in the United States Code, Title 11 which was most recently substantially revised by the Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act, BAP CPA, of 2005. It was the largest reorganization of the bankruptcy code in 25 years. Next, we're going to discuss bankruptcy proceedings. This is how a bankruptcy case generally works its way through the bankruptcy court, from the beginning at filing to the end at discharge. First, under the Bankruptcy Code, each case filed generally proceeds as follows. The debtor files a bankruptcy petition in bankruptcy court. This is the triggering mechanism to start the bankruptcy case, the filing of the petition. Once the petition is filed, the automatic stay order immediately goes into effect. The automatic stay prevents creditors from taking any action, including debt collection, against the debtor or the debtor's estate. Now the automatic stay, which is designed to give a debtor breathing room, goes into effect as soon as the petition is filed. While it is a court order, there's no lag time. Creditors can be sanctioned if they willfully violate the automatic stay, both in terms of money damages, punitive damage, and attorney's fees payable to the debtor. They can also potentially lose all or part of their claim. A willful violation of the automatic stay simply means that the creditor knows the stay is in place, but continues debt collection. The stay generally remains in place until the case is dismissed, though a creditor can request relief from the automatic stay. 
There are exceptions to the automatic stay for serial filers. If a debtor files two bankruptcies in the same year, the stay only lasts the first 30 days, though the debtor can petition the court to extend it. If the debtor has filed three bankruptcies in a year, there is no automatic stay in place at the filing of the petition, though the debtor can again ask the court via motion to impose a stay. The debtor has a high burden in these motions and must prove by clear and convincing evidence that the bankruptcy filing is made in good faith. When there are serial bankruptcy filings, there is a presumption that the filings are made in bad faith to impact creditors adversely. Once the automatic stay is entered, the next thing is the order of relief is entered. This too is pretty automatic and we'll discuss that later. The court then determines if an order of relief from the automatic stay should be granted to a creditor. And this is done by motion to the court. And if no creditor asks for relief from stay, there are no reliefs from stay given. Then the trustee and creditors meet with the debtor and some type of payment plan is created and approved, usually by the creditors in the court. It's either a liquidation plan or a reorganization plan. Then the payment plan is implemented by the actions of the trustee and the debtor. And finally, debts remaining after the plan is implemented are usually discharged, meaning they're forgiven. Next, we will discuss BAP CPA and issues impacting eligibility. This is eligibility to file a bankruptcy and eligibility to maintain a bankruptcy. One of the goals of BAP CPA was to protect consumers and make sure they fully understood the impact of bankruptcy filings and how they could improve their financial positions generally. Under BAP CPA, an individual debtor must undergo credit counseling within 180 days of filing the bankruptcy petition, no matter the chapter. The required credit counseling must be received from a nonprofit budget and credit counseling agency. If the credit counseling is not completed timely, the court will dismiss the petition. Now, another goal of BAP CPA was to prevent parties from gaming the bankruptcy system by filing successive bankruptcies to impede the collection of legitimate creditor debts. BAP CPA also restricts bankruptcy eligibility from serial bankruptcy filers. We talked about serial bankruptcy filers briefly on the previous slide. If an individual was a debtor in a bankruptcy case that was dismissed within 180 days of the new case, the individual can face eligibility and discharge issues under Chapters 7, 11, and 13. However, if the previous bankruptcy was completed rather than dismissed, the individual is generally permitted to file for bankruptcy again. It's about good faith. If a debtor completes a Chapter 7 liquidation bankruptcy, the party is not permitted to file another Chapter 7 proceeding again for eight years. If an individual completes a Chapter 13 bankruptcy, which is hard, they must wait two years before filing another Chapter 13 if they want a discharge of their debts. It's important to recognize that there is a distinction between a debtor's eligibility to file a bankruptcy case and their eligibility to have debts discharged in bankruptcy. Strictly speaking, there are not many restrictions on the physical act of filing for bankruptcy, but serial filers do face restrictions on eligibility to be a debtor under a particular chapter, they face problems with the automatic stay, and whether they can receive a discharge for their debts, which for most debtors that is the point of a bankruptcy filing. In most situations, a debtor can file again and receive a discharge in the second bankruptcy if they didn't receive one in the first matter, though that's not always the case. Also, as I mentioned on the previous slide, the debtor loses the full benefits of the automatic stay, which is the order that stops creditors from collecting when they file multiple cases in quick succession. Now, if the court dismissed the debtor's first case, unless the, order, the court orders otherwise, a debtor can file again. A 180-day waiting period may apply if the debtor failed to obey a court order or appear in the case or voluntarily dismiss the case after a creditor filed a motion for relief from the bankruptcy say. Now, if the court denied your discharge, a debtor might be able to file again, but probably won't be entitled to a discharge of the debts listed in the first case. Next, we will discuss Chapter 7, which involves liquidation proceedings. 
we will go through the procedures in Chapter 7 in a fair amount of detail. Generally, all bankruptcy actions proceed in a similar manner to Chapter 7, and when there are differences, I will point them out as we discuss Chapters 11, 12, and 13 later in the lesson. A bankruptcy filed under Chapter 7 is a liquidation proceeding, also known as a straight bankruptcy. It is the most common bankruptcy filed in the United States. It provides an organized method of selling the debtor's assets and distributing the proceeds fairly among the debtor's creditors. Liquidation occurs when a debtor turns over all his assets to a trustee who takes over the administration of the debtor's bankruptcy estate. A bankruptcy trustee is usually an attorney in private practice who is competent to perform the duties of a bankruptcy trustee has an office or resides in the judicial district and who can post a bond in favor of the United States. They are usually attorneys who specialize in bankruptcy law. The trustee gathers all the debtors non-exempt property and sells it to generate cash proceeds to pay the debtors creditors. Individuals, partnerships, and corporations can be a debtor in Chapter 7 and are eligible for Chapter 7 relief. Railroads, insurance companies, banks, savings and loan associations, industrial banks, credit unions, and health maintenance organizations are not eligible for Chapter 7 relief and therefore cannot be a debtor under Chapter 7. We will begin with the first step in a Chapter 7 proceeding, filing the petition. A Chapter 7 case starts with the debtor filing a bankruptcy petition in federal bankruptcy court and paying the filing fees. Now, most bankruptcies are voluntary proceedings, meaning the debtor files the case himself and voluntarily surrenders his pre-petition assets to form the bankruptcy estate. Sometimes, if a debtor is not paying his debts, creditors can try to force the debtor into bankruptcy through an involuntary bankruptcy petition. Now, the debtor can object within 21 days of service of summons and litigate whether such an action is appropriate, and the bankruptcy judge will ultimately decide the issue, usually after an evidentiary hearing, which is a bench trial in bankruptcy court. If an involuntary bankruptcy was frivolous or filed in bad faith, the creditors can be liable for damages, attorney's fees and costs, plus potentially punitive damages. Farmers, ranchers, nonprofit organizations, and entities that cannot qualify for Chapter 7 can't be forced into bankruptcy. A bankruptcy judge can dismiss a Chapter 7 petition for cause, usually due to failure of the means test, which is income above average in the state and with high consumer debt. Bankruptcy cases get dismissed for a variety of reasons, ranging from intentional misconduct such as fraud, to simply failing to file the correct forms or failing to take the required credit counseling or failing to pay the filing fee. However, the means test is often the stumbling block for debtors. A debtor's disposable income must be low enough to pass the means test before they qualify for a discharge. The bankruptcy mean test compares the debtor's average income for the six month period before filing against the median state income for a similar household. If the income is below the state median, a debtor qualifies automatically. However, if it is above, a debtor still might qualify. A debtor is allowed to deduct the national and local living expense standards for his area, as well as some actual expenses, to determine if the debtor ultimately qualifies for a discharge. If a debtor fails the means test, a court can presume that the debtor is misusing the bankruptcy code, though the debtor can rebut that presumption. Many times, if a debtor fails the means tests, a court will either dismiss the Chapter 7 action or allow the debtor to convert to a Chapter 13 repayment plan. The next step in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy is the automatic stay. Now, I've discussed the automatic stay in some previous slides, but I wanted to go into some detail here. Once the petition is filed, whether it is voluntary or involuntary, the automatic stay is effective immediately. In federal court, all filings are electronic, so there's no lag time. As soon as the petition is entered, the automatic stay takes effect. 
The automatic stay is a moratorium on almost all creditor actions against the debtor with regards to his debts. All debt-related pending lawsuits filed against a debtor are automatically stayed, such as a mortgage foreclosure. All debt collection efforts, such as telephone calls, texts, emails, or letters, must cease. Creditors cannot contact a debtor who has filed for bankruptcy. That is a violation of the automatic stay. Creditors are preventing from filing any new debt collection actions against the debtor. Remember, the automatic stay is designed to give the debtor breathing room so they can assess their options with respect to their debts. However, actions to determine paternity or to collect child support or alimony are not affected or stayed by the automatic stay. This is an exception to that rule and you need to remember it. Willful violations of the automatic stay, which means knowing that there is a stay and collecting anyway, are subject to sanctions. This can be payment of damages, attorney's fees, costs, and possible punitive damages. If a creditor is acting in bad faith, they can also lose their entire claim. Remember, if a debtor has filed a prior bankruptcy within one year of the current case, the stay only lasts the first 30 days unless the judge extends it upon the debtor's motion. The next step in a Chapter 7 case is the order of relief and any motions for relief from stay. After the petition is filed, the next step is for the court to determine whether an order of bankruptcy relief is granted. An order of relief is an order stating that the bankruptcy proceedings can continue. If the filing of the voluntary petition is proper, then the petition automatically becomes the order for relief. If the debtor does not object to an involuntary petition, the order of relief is also automatic. If the debtor disputes an involuntary petition, the court will hold a hearing and determine if an order of relief is warranted. Remember, if the debtor disputes that they should be in bankruptcy, they're entitled to a hearing and then the judge ultimately decides if the order of relief is warranted. But during that time period, the automatic stay is still in effect. After the order of relief is entered, the US trustee appoints an interim trustee to set up the creditors meeting. And around this time, you usually start seeing motions for relief from stay. A secured creditor can file a motion with the court and seek relief from the automatic stay that protects the debtor from collection actions if the secured creditor, it has to be a secured creditor, can show that it does not have adequate protection under the law, which generally means that its collateral is at risk or there's not enough equity in the property to cover the loan. For example, asking permission to continue a mortgage foreclosure or an automobile repossession would be an example of a motion for relief from stay. The next step in a Chapter 7 proceeding is the creditor's meeting. Between 21 and 40 days after the order of relief has been granted, the interim trustee calls the creditor's meeting. This is a meeting of all the creditors listed in the debtor's required schedule for liquidation. Though creditors are not required to actually attend and do not waive any rights if they do not do so. The debtor is required to attend and the trustee conducts the meeting called a 341 meeting, but the bankruptcy judge does not attend. It's called a 341 meeting because it is mandated by section 341 of the bankruptcy code. If a debtor fails to attend the 341 meeting of creditors, his bankruptcy case will likely be dismissed by the court at the request of the trustee without the benefit of a discharge of debts. At the meeting, the trustee and creditors can question the debtor about his finances, assets, and any other relevant matter under oath, and the debtor must cooperate in good faith and provide the required information to the best of his ability. The 341 meeting for the average consumer bankruptcy usually takes less than a half hour. The trustee will go over the bankruptcy schedules with the debtor and ask questions about the debtor's finances, assets, and debts, plus any other matter the trustee feels is relevant to the orderly administration of the bankruptcy estate. Usually the trustee will also make sure the debtor understands the bankruptcy process. The debtor answers these questions under oath, just like any ordinary witness who raises their right hand and takes the oath. 
Creditors rarely attend these meetings, but if they do, they are allowed to ask questions. If it is a joint filing, such as a husband and wife, they both must attend and provide the required information. If the debtor is not cooperative, the trustee can continue the meeting and seek an order from the court ordering the debtor to cooperate or be held in contempt of court. The trustee can also seek to have the bankruptcy dismissed for either failure to attend or failure to cooperate. Next, we will discuss the Chapter 7 trustee and his duties and powers. The trustee's duty is to gather the debtor's pre-petition assets, liquidate non-exempt assets in a commercially reasonable manner, and distribute the proceeds, the cash, to the debtor's creditors in an orderly and fair manner according to the bankruptcy code. First, the trustee will have the debtor's assets appraised. Then the trustee will review the debtor's assets and divide those assets between exempt and non-exempt assets, and we'll discuss what that means in the next slide. The trustee will gather the debtor's non-exempt assets from the debtor or third party holding those assets and sell those assets. The trustee has several important powers to aid his administration of the bankruptcy estate. The trustee can sue and be sued and obtain credit. He has the right to assume or reject executory contracts, which, as you may recall from our lesson on contracts, are contracts that are not yet completed. He can avoid certain liens against the debtor's property, such as those not properly perfected at the time of filing. For example, I had a large bank client in Ohio, and it owned a series of mortgage loans that a Chapter 7 trustee sought to avoid through an adversary action, which is just a lawsuit filed in bankruptcy court. My client was a holder of several first mortgages on property used as rental property owned by the debtor in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. However, it turns out that some of the mortgages were not properly perfected under Ohio law due to some signature and execution errors on the documents that were not corrected prior to the bankruptcy filing. My client's liens on three of the five properties were stripped, avoided, allowing the trustee to sell those properties free and clear of the liens. My client was reduced to an unsecured creditor as to the debts on those three properties and ultimately got pennies on the dollar during the distribution to unsecured creditors. In contrast, on the two properties where the liens were held to be secured, we were able to get relief from stay and the creditor foreclosed and sold the properties and so recovered much more as a secured creditor. There was still a deficiency on the loans owed by the debtor personally on the notes, but that was discharged in the bankruptcy. Next, we will discuss exempt property under Chapter 7. Not all of the debtor's property is subject to sale and liquidation. Exempt property is defined under the Bankruptcy Code and has monetary caps adjusted every three years based on the Consumer Price Index. So you can exempt property up to the cap depending on the type. Exempt property includes such things as the debtor's home, an automobile, personal and household goods, furnishings, clothing, appliances, books, animals such as pets, crops and musical instruments, jewelry, tools of the trade or professional books, an unmatured life insurance policy, professionally prescribed health aids, and certain personal injury awards. Some retirement funds such as an IRA, and then there is a wild card exemption that's usually just a few thousand dollars. 100% of Social Security, Veterans, and Civil Service retirement benefits are protected. They're exempt property. Debtors also have the option of choosing state law exemptions instead of the federal exemptions if the state they live in has opted out and passed their own exemptions. You can't pick and choose. You either take the federal ones or the state ones. Sometimes these are more favorable, such as homestead for their primary residence. For example, in Kansas, the homestead exemption allows a debtor to protect the entire value of his primary residence, which is very valuable. The exemption is unlimited, but the land protected is only one acre in the city and 160 acres of farmland. In contrast, in Missouri, the exemption only protects up to $15,000 of your home equity and the land it sits upon. The federal monetary exemption for homestead is more favorable, so it really just depends on where you live. Kansas debtors almost always choose the Kansas exemption, particularly if they're trying to protect their home. Now, the debtor is required to list all his claimed exempt property in his schedules. A creditor can object to any claim exemption, 
If a creditor does not object, a debtor can exempt the property as scheduled, even if the property may not have been properly designated as exempt. Next, we will discuss preferential payments and fraudulent transfers in Chapter 7 proceedings. Now, prior to filing bankruptcy, sometimes a debtor will pay a creditor that they shouldn't, and other times they will fraudulently transfer property to try to hide it from the bankruptcy court. As we discussed previously, the bankruptcy trustee has broad powers to administer the bankruptcy estate. One of those powers is the ability to retake or claw back these payments and put them back into the bankruptcy estate. Now, the first type of payment that a trustee can claw back are preferential payments. These are payments made by an insolvent debtor that gives a preferential treatment to one creditor over another. These are payments that allow a creditor to receive more money than the creditor would receive in the bankruptcy proceeding, which creates a disadvantage to other creditors. The trustee can recover preferential payments that are made within 90 days of the bankruptcy filing. If the preferential payment is to an insider, such as a relative or partner, the trustee can recover these payments made within one year of filing. There are defenses, such as a transfer in the ordinary course of business or giving new value. The second type of payments that can be clawed back are fraudulent transfers. This is a transfer of property made with intent to defraud creditors or made for an amount significantly lower than the property's fair market value within two years of filing for bankruptcy. This primarily deals with a debtor trying to shield or hide assets through these types of transfers. Next, we will discuss prioritizing creditor claims in Chapter 7. One of the trustee's main duties after holding the 341 meeting is to classify and divide up creditors according to their claims and types. Within 90 days of the 341 meeting, all creditors except secured creditors must file a proof of claim, what's called a POC, with the bankruptcy court in order to receive a portion of the debtor's bankruptcy estate. The POC contains the creditor's name, address, and the amount of the debt owed. It's a very easy form to file electronically online with the court. It takes about five minutes. If the creditor does not file a POC, the creditor may not receive any payments from the estate on their debt. If you do not file a POC as an unsecured creditor, you will not be paid. However, a POC does not automatically mean the creditor will receive payment. It just gives notice to the trustee that they have a claim, and then it's up to the trustee to review and approve that claim. A trustee will review the POC and determine if the POC is allowable, meaning is it a valid claim. And there are numerous defenses to a creditor's claim. I don't expect you to know the, all the defenses, but you need, need to know that the POC is not automatic and that there are defenses and the trustee can challenge it. If a creditor is a secured creditor that has a security interest in the debtor's property, the secured creditor has first claim to the property, even in bankruptcy. Most of the time, debtors file bankruptcy to preserve property, particularly their home if they are an individual. A lot of times, individuals file bankruptcies to stop a mortgage foreclosure. They want the breathing room a bankruptcy filing gives them to regroup and try to save their home. Sometimes, though, the debtor can surrender the property to a secured creditor to satisfy the debt. If they don't think they're ever going to be able to make the payments, even after they come out of bankruptcy, they may decide to surrender their home to the creditor to satisfy the debt. Alternatively, after relief from stay, they must get relief from stay, a creditor can foreclose on the property and use the proceeds to pay or reduce the debt. The secured creditor is only secured up to the value of the property. If the proceeds of a foreclosure sale do not satisfy the debt, the secured creditor would have an unsecured claim on the deficiency, though the debtor can discharge that debt. The reality is unsecured creditors, such as a secured creditor now only holding a deficiency, get pennies on the dollar, if anything, in an individual bankruptcy. The code establishes classes of priority claims, and all the creditors in a class must be paid before the next class receives payment. Secured creditors are paid first from liquidated, non-exempt property, depending on their individual liens on each item of property. Secured creditors get paid first. 
They are at the head of the lunch line. Unsecured claims are paid last. Unsecured claims have 10 different classes for payment and are based on the classes in Exhibit 19-5. If there are insufficient funds to pay all the creditors in a class, they are paid proportionately and the next class gets nothing. After the creditors are paid and the bankruptcy is finished, the debtor gets what they call a discharge in Chapter 7. If a debtor completes his bankruptcy in good faith, any listed but unpaid debts are generally discharged or forgiven, and the debtor is no longer liable for these debts. The bankruptcy court issues what is called a discharge order, which states that the debtor's debts are discharged and the debtor is immune from debt collection on the discharged debts. There are some debts that are exempt from discharge. Creditors can object to discharge of their particular debt, but it is not that common for ordinary cases and is usually only done when there was fraud or misconduct prior to the bankruptcy. Bankruptcy judges are not going to exempt an individual creditor's debt from discharge unless there was fraud or misconduct on, part, on the part of the debtor. Under the code, there are certain types of debts that are not dischargeable, such as child support, alimony, student loans, unless the debtor can prove undue hardship, and debts not scheduled on the bankruptcy schedules, and many types of taxes. The complete list is in Exhibit 19-6. If a debtor is found to have acted fraudulently or in bad faith, a discharge can be revoked within one year of the discharge order being entered. Now, I want to talk a little bit about student loan debt because there's this myth out there that student loan debt can never be discharged in bankruptcy, and that's simply not true. In fact, there's been a lot of litigation on the dischargeability of student loan debt in the last decade. Student loans are difficult but not impossible to discharge in bankruptcy. To do so, a debtor must show that the payment of the debt will impose an undue hardship on the debtor and the debtor's dependents. This requires an adversary action, an actual court proceeding, seeking this determination from the bankruptcy court. Now, creditors, would, of course, object to the request. In determining whether or not there's an undue hardship, courts use different tests to evaluate whether a particular borrower has shown undue hardship. The most common test is the Bruner test. This is named after a case out of the Second Circuit in 1987 called Bruner versus New York State Higher Education. Now the test requires a showing that the debtor cannot maintain, based on current income and expenses, a minimal standard of living for the debtor and the debtor's dependents if forced to repay the student loans. Additional circumstances exist indicating that this state of affairs is likely to persist for a significant period of time of the repayment period of the student loans, and the debtor has made a good faith effort to repay the loans. Most, but not all, courts use this test. As I said, Bruner is out of the Second Circuit and it was decided in 1987. And a lot has changed since this 1987 court decision, and some courts have begun to question whether they should use a different standard. For now, most federal courts of appeal have adopted the Bruner test, but the law in this area is changing. More circuit courts are looking at more fact-based examinations of undue hardship. In the Tenth Circuit, when courts consider discharge of student loan debt under the undue hardship standard of Section 523, the Tenth Circuit has adopted the three-part Bruner test, but has cautioned that in the interest of bankruptcy's commitment to providing debtors a fresh start, the test should not be applied too restrictively. Rather, the Tenth Circuit applies a fact-intensive analysis intended to result in discharge of student loans when the debtor truly cannot repay them. If a court does find an undue hardship, the court can discharge all the loan debt, discharge some of the loan debt, or require the debtor to pay all of the debt. However, if the debtor has to pay some or all of the student loan debt, the court can order the repayment with better terms, such as a lower interest rate, and that happens a lot. Before we leave Chapter 7 and move on to the other chapters, I wanted to talk about one other important topic, reaffirmation of debt. Sometimes a debtor may elect to pay a debt that is otherwise dischargeable in bankruptcy. This is called reaffirming the debt. In order to pay a dischargeable debt, the debtor and creditor enter into a reaffirmation agreement prior to the discharge order. These have to be in writing and signed by the debtor. 
since the goal of bankruptcy for debtors is the forgiveness of debts these agreements are scrutinized extensively by the bankruptcy court to make sure creditors are not pressuring debtors into signing these agreements they're not favored there is a form that the debtors the bankruptcy attorney must sign that certifies the debtor is voluntarily entering into the agreement and the agreement will not cause a hardship to the debtor many debtors attorneys will not sign these and therefore there must be a hearing on these agreements before the bankruptcy judge for mortgages there is little incentive to reaffirm the debt but for car loans under the code if the debt is not reaffirmed the lender generally has the option to repossess the car after bankruptcy even if the debtor is timely on the payments. Now, most creditors know that they will make more money if the debtor is making its monthly payments rather than selling the car at auction, which is basically a fire sale. However, there are some big car lenders that will repossess a car post-bankruptcy without a reaffirmation agreement. A debtor needs to know what their options are with respect to their individual lender and whether or not they need to do a reaffirmation agreement. They're not common with mortgages, but you see them more often with cars. Now that we've completed Chapter 7, we will move on to Chapter 11, Reorganization. Unlike Chapter 7, which liquidates the debtor's bankruptcy estate, Chapter 11 allows the debtor, with agreement with its creditors, to create a plan to reorganize a debtor's financial affairs under supervision of the bankruptcy court. Generally, debtors and creditors agree that certain parts of a debt will be discharged while other parts will be paid. While they do not always agree on a specific plan, most creditors believe that they will generally be paid more by an ongoing business than they would receive if the business is liquidated, broken up, and sold in parts. Chapter 11 cases are usually filed by corporations, partnerships, and limited liability companies, but individuals who make too much money or have too much debt to file Chapter 7 or 13 can also file Chapter 11. Stockbrokers, commodity brokers, banks, and savings and loans are not eligible. Next, we will discuss Chapter 11 Reorganization Court Procedures. Generally, the bankruptcy court procedures are the same as in Chapter 7, but instead of a liquidation plan, the debtor files a reorganization petition with a reorganization plan. This is called an adjustment of ongoing debt. The automatic stay also applies immediately when the petition is filed and continues throughout the reorganization plan. As part of the plan, the debtor must file a list of creditors. Once the order of relief is entered, the bankruptcy court appoints a trustee who then appoints a creditors committee of unsecured creditors. The committee is supposed to represent the range of creditors as fiduciaries, particularly if there are hundreds of creditors for a large business. There are supposed to be seven creditors on the committee. The trustee is responsible for developing the reorganization plan with the debtor to handle creditor claims. The reorganization plan is a contract between the debtor and its creditors with the goal of rehabilitating the debtor's business while preserving the assets for the creditors. Reorganization plans generally have three things. The classes of claims and interests in the debtor's property, the treatment for each class of creditors, and a description of the means for execution of the agreement. The debtor has the exclusive right to file a plan within the first 120 days of the case filing. If the debtor files his plan within 120 days, no creditor can file a plan within the first 180 days. This gives the debtor time to negotiate with and persuade creditors to accept their plan. For the plan to be accepted, two-thirds of creditors of each creditor class must vote to approve it. If it is approved by creditors, the court must also then approve it. This is called plan confirmation, and there's usually a hearing on that. Upon plan confirmation, the debts not under the reorganization plan are discharged. Now, if a court refuses to confirm a Chapter 11 plan because it is not in the best interest of the creditors, it will usually permit the party proposing the plan to modify the plan so that it can be confirmed. If the court refuses to confirm any plan, the Chapter 11 case must either be dismissed or converted to a Chapter 7. 
Next, we will discuss Chapter 13. Chapter 13 of the Bankruptcy Code governs individual repayment plans. Chapter 13 of the Code covers adjustments of debts for individuals. It permits individuals to pay their debts to creditors in installment plans under the supervision of the Bankruptcy Court. Chapter 13 plans are similar to Chapter 11, but they are simpler and less expensive. They are only voluntary plans. Creditors cannot force an individual into bankruptcy. The plans must be for a minimum of 36 to a maximum of 60 months. Only individuals are allowed to file under this chapter and there are debt caps. Debtors can only qualify for a Chapter 13 if their total unsecured and secured debts are less than the limits set forth in the Bankruptcy Code. The Bankruptcy Code provides for an automatic adjustment to the debt limits every three years to reflect changes in the Consumer Price Index. The last time it was adjusted was April of last year. As of April 2019, the adjusted debt limits to qualify for Chapter 13 are $419,275 for a debtor's unsecured debts and $1,257,850 for a debtor's secured debts. As with every chapter, the case is commenced by the debtor filing a bankruptcy petition with the appropriate schedules of debts, assets, and creditors. The debtor can propose a plan with additional time to pay his debts, ask for the debts to be reduced, or both. The automatic stay applies immediately once the petition is filed, but unlike other chapters, it also extends to a creditor's attempts to collect from co-debtors like a spouse. This can be very useful, especially if the spouse does not file for bankruptcy. After the petition is filed, the court calls a meeting of the creditors where the debtor presents her repayment plan. The plan does not have to fully repay all claims, but must treat each class of creditors equally. It must be at least 36 months long unless the court approves a longer plan up to 60 months. The length of plan depends on your regular monthly income and how long you need to repay your debts. Next, we will discuss Chapter 13 plan approvals. Creditors do not vote on a Chapter 13 plan like they do in a Chapter 11. That's very important and you should remember that. Rather, in Chapter 13s, the plan is approved by the Bankruptcy Court. The court holds a hearing on plan confirmation. Creditors have the opportunity to object to the plan at the hearing. However, the court can overrule any objections by creditors and confirm a plan made in good faith if all the debtor's disposable income is used to make plan payments. However, Chapter 13 plans cannot be confirmed unless the unsecured creditors are paid at least as much as they would have received in a Chapter 7 case. That's usually not a problem because in Chapter 7, most unsecured creditors get little to nothing. Since the enactment of BAP CPA, debtors have limited availability to modify a secured claim and keep the collateral. This is generally known as a cram down. This reduces the principal debt owed to the value of the collateral and can reduce the interest rate too. A debtor cannot cram down the secured first mortgage on their principal place of residence, though they can do so for second mortgages, car loans, consumer goods, and investment property. Most courts require that loans that are crammed down be paid off when the, within the three to five year length of a Chapter 13 plan. It makes it hard to cram down an investment property or a second mortgage for most people because they can't really pay it off within the three to five years of their plan. Most people use Chapter 13 to cram down a car loan. For example, if Betty owns a car worth $5,000, but her loan balance is $10,000, then she can cram down her loan to $5,000, which is the value of the car, through her Chapter 13 repayment plan. The remaining $5,000 of the balance will be lumped in with any of her unsecured creditors, like credit cards. This means she will likely pay only a percentage of that unsecured debt, and the remainder will be wiped out at the completion of her plan. This means Betty will end up owning the car free and clear at the end of the bankruptcy. However, there are certain restrictions on when a debtor can use a cram down to prevent people from cramming down their recent purchases. 
For cars, the debtor had to have purchased the car 910 days, which is two and a half years, prior to the filing for bankruptcy. For consumer goods that have a secured interest like a TV or furnishings, the debtor has to have bought the item one year prior to filing for bankruptcy to use cram down procedures for the loan. We will finish up Chapter 13 here with plan administration and discharge. Once the bankruptcy court approves a debtor's Chapter 13 plan, the court appoints a trustee to carry out the payment plan and oversee the debtor's bankruptcy, just like in every other chapter. Chapter 13 trustees are usually what they call standing trustees, meaning most of their practice is serving as a trustee for Chapter 13 debtors. The debtor makes plan payments to the trustee, not creditors, and then the trustee disperses the money to creditors each month based on the plan distribution scheme. The trustee is paid for his or her work through a percentage of the funds distributed to creditors and depends on the trustee's agreement with the U.S. trustee, but the maximum they can charge is 10% of the monthly payment. The debtor must begin making payments on the plan within 30 days of plan confirmation. If the debtor fails to make payments, the plan can be converted to Chapter 7 or dismissed, though the debtor might also be able to modify the plan or ask for a hardship discharge, which is rare and hard to get realistically. If the debtor does complete the plan, his remaining debts are discharged, except non-dischargeable debts like taxes and domestic support obligations, which we've mentioned previously. We will finish up our discussion of bankruptcy with Chapter 12 plans. These are family, farmer, and fisherman plans. Chapter 12 provides for the adjustment of ongoing debts of family, farms, and fisheries. To qualify for Chapter 12, a family, farm, or fishery must have regular annual income and be either an individual or married couple or a corporation or partnership. The farmer's or fisherman's gross income must be at least 50% farm or fishery dependent. The farmer's debt must be 50% farm related and the fisherman's debt must be 80% fishery related. Farmer's debts must be under 10 million and the fisherman's debt must be under $2,044,225 to qualify for Chapter 12. The Family Farmer Relief Act of 2019 raised the debt limit for family farmers from just over $4.4 million to $10 million as of August 2019, but the rest of the chapter requirements for family farms remained the same. Chapter 12 is modeled after Chapter 13 plans for individuals and generally have the same lengths of plans, procedures, and discharge scope so that a family farmer or fisherman can emerge from bankruptcy, receive a discharge, and retain the farm or fishery along with related personal property. This is the end of Chapter 19, Part 2.